Hi everyone, welcome to the Heart of Homeschooling Parent Education Program. We hope you feel at home as we embark on this adventure together. My name is Shannon Carpenter and I am the Program Director for the Heart of Homeschooling Program. I'm a homeschooling mom of seven kiddos and I've been in this field of education for about 20 years. I believe homeschooling is a life journey and that needs to be shared with community. So it's my hope that you will gather with other homeschooling parents and educators regularly to discuss these relevant topics we cover each month and each week in our Facebook group. Some of you are students with Fresno Pacific University, and so you'll be covering additional topics each time we meet. I'm so, so excited to be here and welcome you all. Usually we are live, but this month I had to record the webinar in advance, so I hope you don't mind. It's also going to be a little bit shorter than usual, and I hope that leaves lots and lots of room for fun discussions in your small groups. We have some great information to cover during our time together tonight. If you have any questions during the webinar, please don't hesitate to email me at heartofhomeschooling at gmail.com, or you can message me in our Heart of Homeschooling Facebook group. Also, if you are not receiving my monthly newsletter, which went out today, you can email me at heartofhomeschooling at gmail.com, and I can be sure to add you to the mailing list. Tonight, we are on session three, which is titled Discover, and we're going to be diving deep into seven different popular styles of homeschooling. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Here we are. Okay, so these are the seven different homeschooling styles we're going to be diving into tonight. We're going to be looking at Charlotte Mason, traditional, classical, unit study, unschooling, eclectic, and finally Montessori. I'm going to go ahead and enlarge my screen. Okay, here we go. So the first one we're going to look at is Charlotte Mason, and I particularly love Charlotte Mason. I do a lot of Charlotte Mason-ish type things in our homeschool. The thing that I love about Charlotte Mason, and by the way, she was an educator that um, was from the UK, and she, she lived about 100 years ago. She um, would put great emphasis on the atmosphere of the home. She really believed that children should be honored and respected and that they um, learned good habits through the habits that were modeled in the home from the parents, from siblings, and so on. Um, she really emphasized attitude, having a good attitude. Um, those character qualities you want to see in your children need to be modeled within yourself first. So it really is um, a great reminder as a parent on how important our attitude is. You know, the old saying, if mom is not happy, nobody is happy. So it's really important to think about those things, especially if you are teaching with the Charlotte Mason approach. Another thing that Charlotte Mason really emphasized was living books. Instead of using textbooks or workbooks as your main curriculum or driving force in um, what you taught, she really emphasized using living books. So if you're, if you're studying a period in history or a particular topic in science, for example, um, she would have the children reading novels about that topic or that subject area instead of reading little bits and pieces broken up throughout a textbook and chapters. She also believed in intentional learning with purpose and um, no busy work. So what that really means is when you're going ahead and planning your lessons for your, for your children, you're going to be thinking about what are their interests, what are particular purposes do they have um, that they're kind of wired for, and you want to go ahead and plan the lessons around those different interests. So if, you, if for instance, you have um, a son that's that's really getting into World War II. Well, perhaps then you should be studying about US history that year and gearing all of your novels and your living books around that subject area. Um, she also believed in uh, lots of nature, lots of exploration outside, outdoor activities, fine arts, and also language. 
So a lot of her lessons, because there was such a large variety of different subject areas that she really emphasized with teaching, she really um, believed in shorter lessons with consistency. So if you were teaching with a Charlotte Mason approach, you would have a schedule that would cover all of these different topic areas, but in shorter lessons. So if, for instance, you're studying foreign languages, it would just be maybe 10 or 15 minutes a day. And having that repetition and that consistency, you see growth over time. Um, a typical day in the Charlotte Mason household, homeschooling household, consists of about two to four hours of lesson plans, and the rest of the time is open free time for exploration. Um, a big part of Charlotte Mason is copy work, narration, and dictation. So the younger child from three, four years old on up to about second or third grade would be doing copy work. So a lot of times the copy work would come right out of the novel you're reading. You might say, okay, I want you to turn to page 50 and copy these first two sentences. And out of the copy work, they learn spelling, they learn grammar, they learn punctuation, they learn vocabulary skills. All of that is corrected hands-on right in the moment. And then as the child grows older, they learn narration which is basically talking to the parent back what they've learned. So if they've read a story or the parents read a story, then they tell, they retell that story for retention, to show retention. And the next day it's usually done again or in a different way. And then dictation is for the older child, like fourth grade on up. And that's when they're, it's similar to copy work, but the parent is actually um, dictating a sentence up to a paragraph or even two paragraphs and the child is copying what they're hearing. So now they're using auditory skills, visual skills, all of those together. And again, the parent is waiting until the end of the dictation to go ahead and correct it. And a lot of times we'll have the student self-correct first to look at the actual passage um, compared to their dictated passage to see where corrections need to be made. And again, they're learning those grammar skills, spelling, um, vocabulary, and punctuation, all in that one lesson. And um, Charlotte Mason is known for the gentle approach to learning, and that's why, because it's a part of your um, whole lesson plan to just incorporate all of these pieces and it's not separated out like other curriculum might do. Examples of curriculum inc include Queen Homeschool. Angela O'Dell is an author that writes a bunch of different um, subject areas related to Charlotte Mason. Ambleside Online and Simple, Simply Charlotte Mason are some of the most popular curriculum options that um, focus with the Charlotte Mason approach. Here's a video you can look at on your own time that um, gives a really good layout of how to begin using the Charlotte Mason approach, and then another link there at the bottom with more information regarding the Charlotte Mason approach. I'm going to go ahead and share these slides out with everybody so you can go ahead and look at it on your own time. And Charlotte Mason is underlined here because there's also another link that, um, that will take you to more information regarding the Charlotte Mason style. Oops, I think I lost my page. Let's see. Stop share. Sorry about that. Let's see, I'll go back to my slides. I shouldn't have uh, clicked on that. Okay, not getting it back. Okay, here we go. So I'll go ahead and share my screen again. Okay, and let me go ahead and do present mode. Okay, so let's get to that slide. All right, now we're on traditional. So traditional is exactly what you would think it is. It follows the core curriculum subjects and standards, as you see over here, this little 
picture of all the different books and topic areas that you would, tr you know, think traditionally would be um, what you would study. Typically, um, it's very structured. So I think it's great for a brand new homeschooling family that's trying to get their feet wet in homeschooling. Um, it typically comes with a teacher's guide. There are clear expectations. Typically there's also quizzes, tests, graded assignments, and clearly laid out instructions and lessons. Um, the homeschool type room is, is set up just like you would think with desks and chalkboards. You might buy um, you know, the alphabet pictures going across the, the wall there. So just, you know, what you would think of as a typical classroom is what you would see in a traditional homeschool. Um, each child is in their own grade level. So if you have lots of children, this style can be a little bit challenging. Um, they each have their own set of grade level books. Usually it's that typical grade level, 10 year old is in fifth grade and so on. Um, this, like I said, is a style that works really well for first year homeschoolers. I was a traditional homeschooling mom my first one or two years and then I went woo the other spectrum to the Waldorf side and used Oak Meadow curriculum. Um, I've pretty much tried every single philosophy except Montessori with my kids. Um, this style follows very scheduled plans. In order to complete each of the books that you're going through you have to finish a certain amount each day. There's homework, there's studying just like in a regular school. The lessons tend to be longer. They last usually between 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how quickly your, your child can complete the lessons. Of course, um, there are moms that, and dads that will, you know, just say something like, oh, just do the odd numbered questions or the even numbered questions because there does tend to be a lot more practice with this approach because it's really built for a classroom. Um, and the typical day is four to six hours. This type of schooling can be online. It, you can use textbooks or workbooks or a combination of both. Some examples of curriculum that use the traditional approach are Abeka, Bob Jones, Alpha Omega, and Time for Learning. Okay. Then we have the classical. Classical approach, and there's a picture of some typical books that you might see with the classical approach. The classical approach focuses on where the child's development, ch child's mind development is actually, and they call it the trivium. They focus when the child is younger on memorization and repetition. And then the middle years are focused on analytical thinking. And then finally in high school or the teen years, its focus is rhetoric. Um, they have a high emphasis on studying Latin for grammar. Um, they read lots and lots of classical literature. And a lot of times I've had students on my roster when I was a teacher um, that, had the, that used the classical approach. And I was always amazed at the level of reading for those kiddos. Like second and third grade, they were reading books that I would typically see sixth, seventh, and eighth grader reading. So they're always advanced just because of that high level of reading and the literature that they're used to reading. Um, they study typically great leaders, inventors, great artists, great scientists, and philosophers throughout history, especially ancient history. Um, typically you'll see reading discussion groups. It's very common. Um, there's a lot of classical co-ops such as classical conversations. And the, the older children especially will meet and discuss a book they're reading together. It's very common to do that, um, which helps with speech and debate skills later on. It's really um, great with just that public speaking aspect. Longer lessons, sometimes lasting an hour or even longer. A typical day is four to six hours or longer, depending on the age of the child. And some examples of homeschool-friendly classical cur curriculum include Story of the World. Classical Academic Press is a website that carries lots of different subject areas of classical curriculum. And then Classical Conversations is a um, Christian co-op type group that meets and the parents help with the classes and things like that, and they're nationwide. Um, so if you're interested, you could look at any of those types of curriculum. And then there's a link here of the pros and cons of the classical approach. So that's classical. 
Next, we have the unit study approach. And there's a little picture up here of a what they call a lap book, where you just take a folder, a regular manila file folder, and you open it up and then break it up into three parts. And then there's these cute little papers that you fill out based on the thematic approach of, to learning that you are studying. And in this case, it was a, um, a unit study based on of the bumblebee, it looks like. So um, I've used unit studies a lot in my homeschooling. I love unit studies, especially when I am really interested in a topic because it's a really fun way to engage all different ages and stages of learners and, um, and get excited about a topic. So first of all, it's a thematic approach to learning. Um, there's a lot of overlap with grades. You can get a unit study that has a huge grade, grade range, second grade on up to eighth grade and even beyond. Um, it covers multiple subjects based on a theme. The theme can be a historical time period or it can be a subject like bees. There's so many different unit studies. You can Google it and there's unit study packets or you can create your own. Um, if you do create your own, it may involve a lot of preparation on your part, but if you're super interested in the topic, that could be super fun for you. So um, there's really a variety of different ways that you can approach the unit study approach. Um, there, the schedule is usually open-ended. It's just totally dependent on how much time you want to invest. So if you're studying bees, for example, um, it may last two weeks or two months or longer, depending on the depth of learning and how much you want to get into it with your children. Um, it incorporates field trips and the whole family, really. Dad can get involved on the weekend. If you're studying bees, again, you can go visit a bee farm on a Saturday and it can relate to your study the following week. Um, field trips are, you know, the sky's the limit with what you can include with field trips. Um, reading is done with the whole family as well. If you want to incorporate dad or mom and they are both working during the day, you can do the reading in the evening and then um, do more studying on the weekend. So there's really a lot of flexibility with this approach. Um, it, it, it can include virtual resources, books, textbooks, curriculum. Again, the sky's the limit with the resources that you can use. It's just all based on that theme that you're choosing to study. Um, a typical day is two or more hours because a lot of times the unit study does not include math. So you're going to want your child, if you want them to be using a curriculum for math, to, that will be their independent time. And they'll also have some other independent time. And then typically the unit study is covering language arts, history, and science, or it could just be language arts and history or language arts and science or, you know, combination of one or two or three different subjects. And then the, the students would then have their own subjects they're going to be covering based on their interests or their developmental level. Um, notebooking is also used in unit studies and lap booking like in the picture. Notebooking is just where you write a line piece of paper and it goes into a notebook, all of the different things that you're learning, kind of like a scrapbook. Some examples of curriculum include a Prairie Primer, which is based on Little House series, and we actually are using that right now. Um, American Girlhood is based on the seven American Girls in uh, starting with Kaya on up to Molly, I believe. So it studies the different periods in history from 1750s on up to 1950s. And then literature unit studies, if you go to Rainbow Resource, which is a great resource or um, lots of different, different um, homeschooling uh, vendors, they carry literature unit studies based on a book. Like I have one on Charlotte's Web and I have uh, one on the Lord of the Rings. So there's a lot of different literature unit studies out there, and then they pull in the history and they pull in the science based on the activities that you do. And then here's a link on more information on unit studies. And so that's our, our information for unit studies. Now we have unschooling, and I did a little unschooling video a couple of weeks ago, so please go ahead and go to the Facebook group if you want to find out more about that. It was just an overview of, of unschooling. Um, a lot of times, unschooling, unschoolers get a bad rap because a lot of times people think unschooling means no schooling or unparenting, and that is not the truth. Unschooling is just as, um, as valuable as the other types of philosophies. It's just a different approach. It's more child-led. It's more interest-led. It's, it's a personalized learning approach. The, the parent 
comes in as the facilitator or the coach encouraging the child to explore their interests through research. So the, the parent really is um, directing the education, but they're allowing the child to really explore and delve into what their interests are. So um, there's lots of discussion, lots of discussion happening throughout the day and around the dinner table about what the child is interested in. And then the wheels are turning in the parent's head. So for instance, if I'm around the dinner table and my son is like, oh my gosh, mom, guess what? We were, I was out in the field and I saw a squirrel running across that I'd never seen before. And I was like, oh, what did it look like? Well, it had, you know, a puffy brown tail, but it, it was climbing the trees like a gray squirrel. So we go and the next day, I, I, you know, make a mental note. And the next day we go on to the computer and we're looking at pictures of squirrels and he finds a squirrel that he um, saw in the backyard. And then I encourage him to go back and look again to find it, find what the squirrel eats, take pictures, draw pictures, come back in. Maybe we watch a video on, on the squirrel, and then that leads into um, what is the squirrel going to do in the winter? How is it going to find food? And then we talk about other animals. So it just kind of um, trails into other topics. And at the same time, I'm directing him. You know, maybe he doesn't like writing, but he'll type up what he's learning. So he'll, he'll go on the computer and do his research, and then maybe he'll copy and paste information into like a scrapbook. Of, um, of pages where I can print it off, then put it into a notebook and he has his personal book that he's made from the information that he's interested in learning about. Um, and schoolers may or may not use curriculum. The whole point is that the curriculum is not telling them what to do, but it's a tool. It's a tool that's used part as part of their learning. Um, there's lots of free reading and free exploration. Again, though, the parent is helping push and direct and challenge that student, but not so much that they're controlling. There's, they're not controlling the education. Learning is a way of life and it's happening all the time. That's the viewpoint of the unschooler. 24 seven, learning is happening all the time. Every opportunity is a learning opportunity. And if you think about it, every parent was an unschooler from the, child, from, from the child's uh, birth to, to when they started kindergarten. Because you did, did you you didn't write a curriculum on how your child was going to learn to walk, but you encouraged them to take that first step. So it's the same kind of thing. It's that same mentality that you had for your child when they were first learning to talk and to walk and to eat and to do all of those new things that you didn't follow a curriculum for. It was just instinctual, and you're just carrying that on through their life and looking for that that spark in learning and and um, asking questions, lots of questions. What do you think is gonna happen if the squirrel, you know, doesn't have a home to live in? Where would they live? Those types of questions. Letting them critically think about how to answer it. And if they don't know how to answer it, they're gonna look it up just like you would. There's no typical day because every day looks different. Examples of curriculum, there are none because for each homeschool or unschooling family, it's gonna look different. But here's a link to um, a video of the unschooling approach. And then I also included these pictures over here. How do unschoolers learn to read? And how do unschoolers learn math? Learn math? And so it's just some really great ideas here just to kind of um, connect you with this, this philosophy in understanding, because I think this is probably the most un misunderstood um, approach to homeschooling out there. I get lots and lots of questions about unschooling. I don't unschool personally, like, like uh, on purpose. I definitely unschool. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a not on purpose unschooler. Um, I have more of a unit study approach, but then tons of free time for my kids. And, and, I, and I, like to, I would like to think that we unschool maybe 75% of the time and then 25% of the time it's unit studies. Um, but I love these ideas here on how to learn to read because they are all perfect examples of what I was talking about with just those beginning years and how you taught your child to read and pronounce things. Oh, how did, you know, how do you pronounce grandma? How do you think you spell deer? And just asking those questions and they just learn naturally. It's a natural way of learning. Okay, next is eclectic. And eclectic basically is just 
everything we've talked about, but a little hodgepodgey, a little bit of everything. And I just love this picture of this homeschooling girl and all of her books that she's chosen, Girl Scouts and a science textbook. And then it looks like a DK book, just all these different things. It's just, you know, you, it's just, you can pick it. And she's, it's similar to unit studies, except there's not a theme. So now the homeschooling parent is is not sticking to one particular curriculum or one particular style. They're doing what they want, but they're still covering all of the different core academic areas in a organized fashion. So basically you're eclectic if all the homeschooling styles sound good to you and you just can't pick one. So you pick and choose your favorite thing to do. Um, a lot of times eclectic homeschoolers get involved in co-ops or other types of classes because they really like to do everything. They like to do play dates. They like to do park days. Not that the other ones don't, but eclectic homeschoolers especially have a little bit of everything going on. Um, there's a lot of free reading and exploration in their day. Learning is a way of life, so that's similar to the unschooling, and it's happening all the time. Curriculum might be used or it might not, or it might, you know, partially be used, like this science textbook that's being used right here. Um, some examples of eclectic curriculum include Bookshark, and I included Bookshark on there because if you look at Bookshark, it really is a combination of traditional Charlotte Mason and unit study all in one. Uh, My Father's World is another example of similar to Bookshark, and then here's a link to a video to tell you more about eclectic homeschooling. And finally, we have Montessori. And Montessori is probably the one philosophy that I have the least amount of exposure to. Um, I have a little bit of exposure. My girls went to a Montessori class um, several years ago, and I, I was, I'm close friends with the instructor. And so I learned a little bit about Montessori approach through her. Um, and I just really was drawn to the first point here, and that's the nurturing of the whole child. I'm I'm a nurturer, you know, by instinct, um, you know, my mothering. And so I was really drawn to that in the Montessori approach. Um, they, there's just this piece that fills the classroom and there's a lot of nurturing that goes on. There's a lot of paying attention from the teacher or the parent if they're homeschooling with the Montessori approach that is paying attention to the emotional side of the child and where they're at emotionally and making that emotional connection to learning. The foundation is, um, is encouraging lifelong learning and that incorporates any type of subject area. Um, the learning environment has a lot of order to it and it's very simple. So um, in this picture here, you see a lot of wood. So it's kind of Waldorf-ish too because of the wood and the, the um, simple aspects of it. And I think the reason for that is because you want to have the child use their imagination and again, that emotional side. So they're connecting with the tools and the pieces of learning, but they're also identifying their emotions to it. Um, there's a lot of self-directed choices which create purpose in their learning. So in this picture, for instance, if the child was to take the globe, the parent then would then uh, teach them about the different parts of the globe and earth and geography. Um, there's a, a learning as a way of life, like I said before, and it's happening all the time. A typical day is three to four hours, but it can be longer depending on the situation, the learning situation. Hands-on learning whenever possible. So again, you see in this picture, not a lot of books. You see a lot of manipulatives in that picture because in, in uh, Montessori, they're picking up things and playing with them, puzzles, puppets, manipulating the different learning tools. Um, practical life exercises are used to strengthen focus. So there is a lot of practical life type um, activities like cooking, baking, um, playing with clay, putting things together, painting, experiences are um, a large part of Montessori. Examples of curriculum, there's actually, I found a new homeschooling curriculum on this link here. So if you're interested in Montessori, um, it is kind of new to the homeschooling world. Um, I've been doing this for about 20 years and it's only been recently that we see Montessori 
concepts being um, put into a homeschooling situation or curriculum. And then there's a video of Montessori with a little taste of Waldorf in there too. So if you're interested in Waldorf, be sure to click on that link to learn a little bit more. Waldorf and Montessori have a lot of overlapping methodologies. So last but not least, if you still are super confused or you don't know what your homeschool style is, don't worry. There is a quiz right here. So here is the link. Go ahead and grab these, um, these uh, slides and for, they'll be on the website, they'll be on uh, the newsletter they sent out, they'll be on the Facebook group. Grab these slides and click on this link here where it says take a quiz. Be sure to take the uh, Discover Your Homeschooling Style quiz to see where you end up and what your score is. And then at the end of the quiz, there will be another link to one of these um, different homeschooling styles so you can learn more. And there's just a ton of information online um, for you to learn all about the different homeschool styles. And then of course, there's a different curriculum that's associated with the styles as well. If you have any questions regarding um, what style you most fit with, what style your kids fit with, or your family lifestyle, or how to schedule a day with a different style, um, be sure to email me. I am happy to talk about it. I love talking about the different homeschooling styles that we have available. And um, there's so many resources available, like I said before. So um, I have so enjoyed um, meeting with you tonight. Whoops. And, um, and I uh, look forward to our next month when we gather together again. And um, I just hope that you enjoyed tonight as much as I did. Thank you and take care.